Okay. I will let you know when we're live. I wish there was a, a quicker way. <laughs> it takes like a minute. Okay, it's connecting and we are connected. Okay. We're alive. So I'll let you know when we're live. connecting and uh, the sound of here. All right. You can start the introductions. I'll speak to you later. Okay, I guess this will be, you. since it's just David, it might be just be about 30 minutes. That'll be fine. Okay. All right. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Hello, and welcome to the second annual African Film Festival Atlanta. My name is Judith Adu, and I'm on the executive board of AFF, AFAF. Uh, and um, it's my privilege to be here today as a film producer and a film lover. Um, we're going to present some films. At present, we have one of the filmmakers with us, um, and so we'll, we'll start with him. But before we do, I just wanted to mention a couple of quick things. And that is the African Film and Arts F Foundation is a nonprofit 501c3 arts organization based in Atlanta, Georgia. And its mission is to magnify and celebrate the vis visions, voices, lives, and stories of people from Africa and the African diaspora. And we execute our mission currently by producing two main events, Cinema for the Culture, a monthly film screening and conversation with filmmakers and the African Film Festival Atlanta, which is a three-day festival showcasing films from around the world. Our theme this year is redefining the African voice, one story at a time, and being responsible for highlighting the brilliance of new and emerging filmmakers. It's a feat that AFFA is committed to being a front runner in this space. We're grateful that we're here today and have your support. This festival offers the opportunity to support the, even, the ever-growing African film community in Atlanta, and as you know, Atlanta has a significant number of African migrants, and it's reputed to be the third largest settlement for Africans in the United States. Coupled with the fact that Atlanta is the epicenter of, film, of the film industry in Georgia, a state that produces the largest quantity of film in the United States, uh, the homegrown African Film Festival in Atlanta is long overdue. So with that, I want to um, introduce um, the director of From Durban to Tomorrow, Dylan Mohan Gray. Uh, he's with us from Mumbai. Uh, he just mentioned he is an Indian Canadian and living in Mumbai and telling stories that include African stories. So he's a globalist. Um, welcome, Dylan. Um, you. Would you just share with us a little bit about your background, how you got into film, and then let's dig into this particular film. Thank you. Uh, how I got into film. So I, I was... Um... As, as mentioned, I, I actually grew up uh, primarily in Canada and um, I was uh, sort of drafted into a local theater group when I was a kid. I started acting uh, when I was maybe uh, around mm, eight years old, something like that, in um, local community theater. And, um, and that, you know, I really enjoyed that. And then I, after some time, started getting interested in writing plays and directing plays. And then, um, you know, with some friends, we started making videos around the age of uh, probably around 12 or 13, using the, the sort of school equipment that was primarily intended for uh, shooting uh, sports matches and practices and things. So uh, in between sports matches, we uh, would uh, sign out the, the school um, video camera and, uh, and make <clears throat> different types of videos. Uh, horror movies, <laughs> all kinds of things like that. Um, and um, then, you know, I continued, I, I was very involved with theater and I continued acting and, and directing and writing theater and uh, right into college. And I, I went to, actually, I went to um, college in the US, uh, in New England um, and uh, continued that there and started, um, you know, becoming part of the the, the film studies community at the university, uh, which was mainly film theory and history, but we did do, uh, we did make films as well and do product, some production work. Um, and uh, quite a number of people I went to college with ended up becoming, you know, uh, professional filmmakers, some of them uh, quite celebrated ones. Uh, so, you know, that community continued to sort of nurture our, our, our growth. Um, and um, then I actually got a little bit away from the film thing. Uh, and I, I was really um, 
focus more on academia and I was doing my graduate work in history and uh, that took me to to Europe and I, I lived in Europe for about 12 years. Uh, I was mainly based in, um, in Budapest and to some degree in Berlin as well. <clears throat> and um, so I was studying, I was doing my graduate work in history and then by sheer chance I happened to meet somebody that I used to act with virtually on the street and that sort of pulled me back into into the film industry because he was actually in Budapest working on um, on a film with David Cronenberg. Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, then I started working in the film industry uh, alongside my academic pursuits and I uh, was uh, started working in, in movies and commercials uh, uh, as an assistant director, first of all, then the second unit director and I started working as a line producer, got a, you know, kept delaying sort of getting through my own films for, for some time. Um, and then what, um, what brought me back into um, directing, I'd done some shorts and things and I, what, what got me into directing nonfiction and particularly feature length, my first feature length project was um, a film called Fire in the Blood, which I, I imagine many of your, of your festival goers have, have seen, you know, as, which is, is sort of a, in a sense, a companion piece to From Durban to Tomorrow. It's all about, um, you know, how, how low cost AIDS medicine was essentially blockaded from reaching Africa and other parts of the global south uh, through the efforts of the multinational pharmaceutical industry and their allies in, in Western governments, particularly the United States, but not only the United States. Um, and, you know, we estimate that um, that blockade costs about 10 to 12 million lives that could easily have been saved with existing medication that was available, uh, you know, at a very low cost in India, in Brazil, in Thailand, and, and various other places where there was capacity to scale up production and there was a legal framework for producing generic medicine. So, you know, that again was a very Af Africa-centric story and most of the main characters were African of various stripes. Um, and we shot in um, in different parts of South Africa, in Uganda, in Mozambique. Um, those are the primary uh, sort of locations for that film. And then from Durban to Tomorrow, um, how that came about was that one you know one of the organizations that we worked with a lot on the outreach for Fire in the Blood, which is the Open Society Foundation based in New York. You know, I found that I was really on a wavelength with them in terms of you know advocacy work on um, human rights and health. And, you know, my special area was access to essential medicine, but, you know, the overall framework was human rights and health. And, you know, in Fire in the Blood, we featured, um, you know, there's a, there a whole chapter on this very seminal um, conference, which had taken place in Durban, South Africa in the year 2000, which was the International AIDS Conference. And that was really a sort of a turning point in, you know, in the whole global history of human rights and health. And, um, and, you know, it played a very important role in that film as well. And it really, you know, where, where patients and, and allies, you know, really sort of reoriented the conversation towards a rights-based approach to healthcare and the idea of a basic human right to health. Uh, and, you know, in my discussions with the, with, with the Open Society Foundation and some other uh, US-based NGOs, you know, we, we thought it would be important to make another film that would sort of address a lot of the despondency, I guess you would say, that had taken over in the global public health community because of, you know, a resurgence of sort of right-wing populist um, politics, both in the United States, represented in particular by Donald Trump, but in many other places, obviously, you know, we see it here in India, we see it in Brazil, in the Philippines, in Russia, at various places in Europe, et cetera, uh, UK included. So, um, you know, what, what people had found was, you know, that after that conference that we'd mentioned in, in Durban in 2000, you know, there were sort of several years where you could see rapid expansion of, of rights and, um, and access to healthcare and access to medicine by vulnerable communities the world over. And then, you know, there was a sort of a backlash that came through, you know, the, this right-wing populism, which particularly targeted vulnerable communities um, and also targeted international uh, solidarity 
uh, which had played a very, very important role in, um, in for example, getting uh, antiretroviral drugs to some of the really poorest countries um, in Africa and other parts of the global south. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we felt that it was necessary to make a film that would at least acknowledge that this problem existed and right. also, uh, you know, provide a framework for people that had been in the trenches for a long time to dialogue with each other about, you know, the way, the path forward, even if they didn't totally agree with each other, but at least they're coming from the same place of belief in a race-based approach to health and, you know, talking, even if they're not talking directly to one another, the idea of the film was these five characters in different parts of the world coming at this problem from different angles would create a sort of a dialectical kind of conversation that would be very useful for all kinds of stakeholders in this uh, in this in this realm of of of, of health and uh, and human rights. So that's that's how the film came about. Thank you for that. Uh, really helpful. You gave a lovely overview. You know, when you think about making a movie for you as a storyteller and having come at it from theater and writing and everything from line producing now to directing, you know, you have to often make these elevator pitches. Uh, whether it's whoever your funders are, be they organizations or individuals, what was your in your elevator pitch for from Durban to tomorrow? What's the story well, you wanted people to really, really receive? So, well, the thing was that um, in um, with from Durban to tomorrow was a little different in the sense that the foundations actually came to me, and they, you know, they didn't so much say you know what the film should be, but they, you know, they felt there was a real need to address this, this problem, this question, this, this sort of unspoken uh, sense of dread and foreboding and despondency, like I said, that had sort of taken root in the global public health community. And um, so, you know, we discussed how that might be accomplished. I mean, it was that then it became more of, you know, it's sort of a, it's sort of a reverse engineering um, type of, of task where, you know, you have an objective that might not even necessarily be a policy objective. It might be a more of a <clears throat> more of a, a, an idea-based objective, let's say. Uh, and then, you know, what is the what is the best way to effectively communicate that, um, and also do it in a in a way that isn't doesn't feel like something you've seen a million times before. That that sort of you know allows people to easily sort of shut off from you know going to autopilot. Mm -hmm. And what I felt was was really interesting, and, the, and and I drew on my previous experiences working on on Fire in the Blood and and some other health related films, uh, was that you know I was very inspired by the people who have devoted their lives to to these questions. Um, you know, I, I really, I mean, genuinely very moved by the you know the life's journey that they followed and and the eloquence uh, with which they express themselves. And I really wanted to um, forefront those types of people, but also make it clear that, you know, there are many different types of people that, that do this type, that do this work. Uh, and it was also very important to me to show that, um, you know, there are many different situations in which people work. So for example, we have a character, Musli, who in, in the Republic of Guinea, um, and he says very clearly, you know, the type of activism that happened in Durban uh, in the year 2000 and subsequently and through the treatment action campaign, you know, which was highlighted both in Fire in the Blood and from Durban to Tomorrow, which is a huge grassroots organization, very, very powerful. You know, that is something that can function in South Africa, but in Guinea it would not be able to function because the political climate and the social climate does not permit that. And which is unfortunate, but that's the reality, you know? So, and people have to live in the reality, you know? Uh, I mean, of course they, they are trying to constantly expand the space for civil society and for freedom of expression. Uh, but, you know, there are various emergencies going on and the health emergency is just one of them. Uh, so, you know, it was very important for me to say, you know, that if, if you're talking about South Africa, it doesn't represent all of Africa by any means. You know, mm -hmm. it is very much a one face of the continent and there are many others. And uh, a lot of people that face these issues and millions, tens of millions of people facing these issues in Africa do not have 
anywhere near the type of circumstances that exist in a country like South Africa. Mm. And likewise, you know, if we featured, for example, Hungary, where I, I mentioned I used to live, um, again, you know, the situation in Hungary would be quite different from, you know, it's a sort of the middle income country, but, you know, featuring many of the characteristics that we've seen in Central and Eastern Europe, where there's been a major retrenchment of right wing politics, uh, a lot of uh, moralizing from conservative religion, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of demonization of vulnerable communities, including, um, you know, uh, people of various sexual orientations, ethnic minorities, so on and so forth. So, you know, it is important to understand that contexts are very different and the struggles that people face are very different in, in, in these, all these kind of places. And, and often the questions are much more complex than they're made out to be. And that was very important to me in making the film. So I wanted to forefront these five people and like any type of film, I say, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, really casting is, is probably more important than pretty much anything else you do. And so we put a big amount of effort into trying to figure out who our people should be. Uh, we wanted people that you know would work on the front lines, but also can talk about the big picture because which it sounds like an obvious thing. It's not that easy because a lot of people that end up speaking about the big picture, they've sort of moved away from the front lines and they, they sort of move into administrative roles. And, you know, from a filmmaking point of view, it's not that interesting to see somebody in an office sitting at a desk in front of a computer. I mean, that work might be very important, but it's not very visually stimulating and you don't really get a sense of the frontline work through that. But if it's only frontline and you, and you don't have, you know, we wanted people who could sort of move beyond their specific fields of expertise into the wider, in those big picture questions, those global questions, you know, so they could have the, the dialogue on that level. And then, of course, it was very important to have a geographical representation to feature, like I said, countries that are very rarely shown. Um, and to also, you know, have a strong representation of women, to uh, have people working in different aspects of, of human rights. We wanted people, you know, working, for example, with vulnerable communities, sex workers, for example, uh, the, the drug community, then the grassroots, um, you know, movements that are uh, sort of embodied by, exemplified by the Freedom Action Campaign in South Africa. And then we have Musli who in Guinea, who really represents the, you know, could talk about the different responses, the difference in the response to Ebola and HIV. And then we had, you know, Vanessa in, in, in Spain, who was really focused on the legal framework and trying to change the legal framework and the patent system, et cetera. And, you know, also grassroots um, activism in a, wealthy, relatively wealthy West Western country, which is a very different uh, ball of wax. So, you know, that, that was all the alchemy we tried to put together in, 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 you know, presenting a global picture through these five individuals. Excellent, uh, great, great to hear um, you articulate this. Can you tell us a little bit about the budget? I know you, you had these guys coming to you, but can you give a sense of what the budget was for the film in Toto? No, I don't even actually, I don't even really recall exactly what it is. I mean, I would say, um, uh, so yeah, this is a 40 minute film and, and, and it's not, it's an unusual length. Um, and, uh, you know, I really appreciate the festival and, and various other festivals actually taking the film because it's, it, it's not often easy to find a home for a 40 minute film. But the reason the film is 40 minutes is because, you know, it was, first and foremost intended to be a conversation starter and an advocacy film. So it, you know, that length actually is conducive to, to starting conversations, to having, you know, discussions after the film, to be shown to, you know, for in, in conferences, to policymakers, uh, you know, in educational settings, et cetera. So, you know, that it was a very specific um, brief in that sense. And of course, because it is, you know, like fire in the blood, because it's a nonprofit venture, you know, we had a lot of people contributing um, in various ways uh, that would have cost us money otherwise, whether that be legal services, whether that be people, you know, uh, donating their services or, or cutting their uh, rates in order to be part of this film, donating music, donating archival material, etc. So oftentimes, I found this with fire in the blood as well, oftentimes, the actual budget that was spent is not really indicative because of the nature of the process of the project it was being a, being basically a like i said a, a not-for-profit enterprise that really has a, 
a, a sort of social justice imperative behind it that invariably I'm always really moved and, and amazed by how many people come on board and are actually very, very willing and, and eager to, to help us out uh, with, with all kinds of things. So it might be that the, the actual budget is actually half of what it normally would be, let's say. Well, let's, let's say yeah. for, but for, for, budding, for <laughs> budding filmmakers, just to have a yeah. sense to make something like that, knowing what you know that now, uh, yeah. with the tools that are available today, uh, what do you think you could make a movie like that for uh, today? Something similar, just order of magnitude, oh. taking into account all the people who will be delighted to be supportive given the content of the film. Yeah, so I think that, you know, honestly, with a film like this, uh, it's again, it's a tricky one because you're shooting in five different countries, right? Now, in some places, you can actually pick up your entire crew and equipment, and it was someplace like South Africa or India, you know, or, or Budapest, for sure. You know, in a country like Guinea, um, you know, there's basically no, almost nothing there in terms of equipment and crew. You know, we have a fixer who was very, very good, you know, uh, but beyond that, you know, we have to essentially travel with um, every single extension cord even, you know, so uh, that's just how it is. And, and I've worked in a lot of uh, places like that where, you know, there is, you know, an expectation that you're not going to find anything on the ground. You might get lucky. If you end up needing something, you might be able to, to locate something. But oftentimes, you know, you have to make the assumption you're not going to get anything. So you have to fly in with it, um, with your crew as well. And then, you know, for me, it was very important also that um, the film had a, had a, had a, a visual uh, consistency. So I, I really wanted to use uh, the same director of photography for all of the five uh, countries, um, who was the exact same director of photography who shot um, Fire in the Blood. And in order to accomplish that, we did the What did they shoot on, by the way? Just, uh, just who was your DP? And do you remember roughly what they shot on? Oh yeah, so we shot on uh, the Canon uh, C300 Mark II, which is a nice camera. I mean, I, I'm, probably wouldn't use it today because now everything is uh, sort of moved into more of 4K space. Um, well, you can shoot 4K on that as well, but I mean, you, when we did our subsequent film, I mean, the last film I did for Netflix, uh, we used a, a later iteration of that camera, let's say. Um, so, and I like, I really like the color palette. It feels very, I think it's a very, very good camera for, um, for documentary filmmaking, uh, especially in using uh, primarily natural light, uh, which we did a lot of, because you know I really wanted to um, to show a lot of beauty in the places that we go, you know, and the people that we work with, and <clears throat> you can make it much cheaper as well if you want to do it that way. But for me, it was very important to create a strong bond between the viewer and the characters by you know really bringing out the, the beauty of the environment and the people that we are working with. Um, and the work they do in a, in a very strong visual sense. And, you know, my DOP was Jay Odedra, who is, um, who was born in Uganda. Uh, he's a Gujarati of Indian heritage, but he's been living in the UK since he was a pretty small kid because of, you know, Asians being expelled from Uganda at that time, <laughs> shortly after his birth. So um, he's very talented and, uh, you know, we work together on, on quite a few things and uh, it's always a great pleasure. He's also a real, uh, humane uh, individual. So it's, it's especially when we're dealing with uh, sensitive subject matter and vulnerable uh, people, individuals and communities. He's a, an excellent person to work with because he just has so much uh, empathy with people and he's really a good listener. He's really focused on making sure that uh, we're very truthful and authentic in our storytelling. So, um, so yeah, in order to accomplish, you know, being able to budget wise to be able to manage having him uh, shoot the entire film. So we actually did the sound ourselves, um, which I'm, I'm not sure I would necessarily do again because it led to a lot of, uh, you know, issues in, in post-production. I mean, we did our best, but we, you know, there's no substitute for a really uh, good sound mixer. And, uh, you know, we did have uh, quite a few sound issues that we had to deal with in post-production. Mm -hmm. But again, coming back to budget and, and production matters, I mean, you know, this, you know, we're, because of the exigencies of shooting in five different countries, it doesn't matter that it's a 40 minute film, it could be a three hour film. The costs are 
you know, not proportionate to the length of the film because you actually have to physically go to um, all these different places. And we shot, a, on average, we shot about six days uh, per country. Wow. Uh, and I'd gone before to do a certain amount of prep work so that to try to minimize the shooting time. Um, and uh, yeah, so, okay. and yeah. then, you know, music, original music. So, I mean, again, all the, a lot of things you could do, you could do it cheaper. It was very important for me that the film be cinematic, uh, that it really, and it also, you know, I, I don't like to make news pieces. I really want to make, a, uh, you know, films that, um, that have a shelf life that can, you know, be watched for a number of years and still be, you know, relevant and yeah. still be topical and still be correct. And so, um, so yeah, that, that, that was also a consideration. And then of course, you know, that means finding, you know, putting a lot of effort into finding good archival material, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, is video, which is headlines, which is uh, photographs, et cetera. So, um, you know, that, that's a major effort in and of itself, especially when you're dealing with stories that have not been really told that thoroughly um, because they're not part of the mainstream narrative, you know? So you have to, you know, do a lot of extra um, detective work to find, to, you know, to access that material. Uh, but the, on the plus side of it is the material is, I think visually much more compelling because, you know, I always tell people, you know, working with young filmmakers, et cetera, that, we're talking about archive material, people often think of news material, um, much of which, uh, which is fairly expensive, first of all, it's relatively easy to find, but it's fairly expensive to license. Um, but I just also think it's, it tends to be very boring visually. And it also, you know, it's the news, uh, certainly in the United States and many other countries, I would say India as well, the news, the way that news is, is presented, the way that news is shot, is a very much coming from the dominant, um, you know, the elite viewpoint and, and, the, and the dominant classes, the India dominant castes, et cetera. You know, so if you're talking about vulnerable populations and, and, and issues that are pertinent to people who are underrepresented and often, I, want, I, I don't like the term voiceless, but whose voices are often sort of, uh, you know, suppressed, let's say, um, then that material is actually often counterproductive to the effort because the, that material is giving a sense of a sort of a dominant narrative, which is something that we are trying to sort of undermine or, or countervail. Um, so I would much rather find footage that has been shot by individuals who are part of these communities or NGOs, or, you know, you can find them in, in, in various places. Um, it's easier now, of course, because now people have camera phones and, Da, da, da. You know, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we were talking about from Durban to Tomorrow, you know, the archival material is from a period where, you know, the camera phones, certainly in a lot of the Global South countries were, were not present. Uh, and people didn't even, even if they did shoot stuff, that, that footage was not archived because people would just upgrade their phone and they wouldn't necessarily dump that material. Uh, so, sure. so, yeah, there is a lot of detective work involved in that. Last question for you. I'm really grateful for your time. This has been really interesting. Uh, one single memorable moment from the shooting of the film that you want to share. If there's anything that really touched you, moved you, changed you, um, what is it? Uh, and then we'll close with any final remarks you want to make uh, to our viewers. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, like kind of what I alluded to, I mean, we've got uh, in, from Durban to Tomorrow is about five characters in five different countries. And in that sense is in a way, it's sort of like five films, honestly. And I mean, when I did Fire in the Blood, it was eight countries and it was like, it was like shooting eight films. Certainly from a production point of view, it was like shooting eight films. And from Durban to Tomorrow, even more so in a way, because each character is the sort of captain of that ship for, for you know, that part of the film. So the way that the format of, of From Durban to Tomorrow is a bit unique for those who haven't seen it, because we do not, I mean, I chose to not have anybody else interviewed in the film, except for our five protagonists. And anybody else that speaks during the course of the film is coming through the prism of those, um, of those protagonists. So, you know, it's a very um, personal relationship that that I have and the audience builds up with, uh, with each of those characters. 
Um, and each of those five segments are very special to me, honestly. I mean, I'm very inspired by all of them. Um, you know, like I said, Budapest, I used to live there. It was really a, a joy to see that, that the work that uh, Peter was doing it, uh, there and, and seeing a lot of aspects of that city I lived in for a long time that I didn't even know about, you know. Um, and then here in India, I mean, we, you know, our character um, our contributor was, was Nina Seishu, who's very uh, highly regarded advocate, um, you know, works primarily with sex work community here. And that was extremely interesting for me to see how um, the sex work community in Sangli, where she is based, you know, had really um, organized themselves so impressively and, you know, had taken, it had become so empowered and really, um, you know, just defies all kinds of uh, <laughs> preconceptions that you could possibly have. It was a huge eye-opener and, and a really exhilarating experience to, to spend time with Mina and with all the, the women from that community. Um, and then also just being in Guinea, uh, in Conakry uh, with Musli Hu, and it's just, a, it's just a totally different type of country than, um, than you usually end up visiting or working in. Um, you know, very, very interesting in so many ways. And it's, you know, it's, it's sort of, you know, <clears throat> feels like another planet almost because you know you, you don't you, it's not so it's 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 really unusual to go to a country you have to learn almost everything about you know you you, you know you just don't get the the narratives and the histories and the and uh, you know from that and i think the only thing that that people had really known uh, outside of guinea about the country in recent times was that it was the sort of epicenter of ebola um and which did a lot of damage to uh, to the country and its and its prospects and even for people there to travel, et cetera, you know, similar to what had happened to you know with Haitians uh, at the beginning of the HIV epidemic, you know, where there was a lot of stigma and misunderstanding and what have you. So it was really a fantastic experience. I mean, I felt very lucky to be able to go to Guinea and um, and spend time there and uh, and really uh, and in the people that we were working with, we just so wonderful and uh, uh and I, I you know recently there was a, you know a month or, or two ago there was a coup in, in, in Kanakri and I, I was on the phone with, with Musli Hu and I was quite concerned about our, our friends there luckily everything seemed to be fine but um yeah you know it's it's one of those, those those kind of bonds that that you know come up during the course of filmmaking that um that are really priceless and uh you know lifelong lifelong treasured memories well, we, we thank you for sharing some of those treasured memories with us today. Uh, we're talking with Dylan Mohan Gray, the director of From Durban to Tomorrow. Um, I wanna say on behalf of the entire African Film and Arts Foundation, um, thank you for making the movie. Thank you for speaking to us today and our supporters. And we wish you every success in your next endeavor. Please stay in touch. We'd love to see what you're doing and let us know when you're back in Africa or certainly in Atlanta. I will do that. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. I think we're signing off. <laughs>